If you're out in the lobby, please try to make your way into the sanctuary. We're going to get started here. probably most of the folks in the lobby and if they're still chatting out there I'm sure they'll be on their way soon all right Rinda gave me the thumbs up I can go so welcome everyone thank you all for migrating here to this beautiful space tonight uh, we are very very excited to share with you uh, an exploration of the monarch butterfly's journey through the Pacific Northwest, and most importantly, uh, what you can do to help this amazing creature in Central Oregon. So first off, uh, we'd like to thank a few um, organizations, if I can get the clicker right here. There we go. That have helped to make this event possible today. The Sun River Nature Center, Great Old Broads for Wilderness, Discover Your Forest, and the Forest Service. And I'd also like to thank uh, uh, this amazing, our amazing hosts uh, for providing such a beautiful venue to have this event in, the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Central Oregon. So uh, we're really excited to be here. And honestly, I can't think of a better venue to talk about monarchs in. It's truly inspiring. My name is Katya Speaker. I'm a member of Monarch Advocates of Central Oregon, also known as MAKO. MAKO is a citizen advocacy group that works to help the monarch butterfly and other pollinators through facilitating the creation of monarch way stations and planting native milkweed in Central Oregon. We started in July of last year with a $1,000 grant from Awesome Bend. And since then, we've had the pleasure of working with several uh, very passionate organizations and uh, citizens in our community to help create Monarch Way Stations in nine different uh, community gardens in Bend. So I have to say that that was only 10 months ago so we're not even into a year yet, and um, the amount of support that we have received from um, this community, and um, gosh, just the rally cry that, is, that has happened, um, thanks to us getting the word out about monarchs, about them being here in Central Oregon, and about them needing more habitat. Uh, it has really uh, turned into a movement and had a momentum of its own. So uh, we can only take so much credit for that, I feel like, because um, people are so passionate about this and we have such a supportive community. So um, let's see. With that momentum, this year we have plans to expand our Monarch Way Stations uh, throughout the rest of Central Oregon into other cities like Redmond and Prineville. And, um, and we also would like to start planting milkweed in rural areas as well. And we'd also like to help to restore some of the uh, native wild stands of milkweed that are on public lands. We also started a um, education program to help with Monarch curricula uh, for local teachers and schools. That has also um, really grown like, uh, like weeds, pardon the phrase. Um, and, uh, and is, very, is becoming very popular, so we're excited about that. 
Um, and the final thing, which is a lot of what about tonight, what about tonight is, is basically we'd like to start a citizen science program um, to start getting people from our community that are so passionate about this um, signed up with us to help us do some milkweed monitoring and some uh, monarch monitoring here in Central Oregon. Um, so we hope that some um, <coughs> passionate people like yourselves will join us um, on that citizen science movement. So next, um, I'd just like to briefly share, um, oh, I'm sorry, hold on, I forgot something. <laughs> so we do not have a website, but we do have a Facebook page. Um, and it's just Monarch Advocates of Central Oregon, pretty simple and straightforward. We have a ton of posts on there from when we started in July of all the plantings that we've done, the way stations that we've done, and a ton of resources. So if anybody has questions um, that we can't answer here tonight, we would direct you to our Facebook page. And here is the list of community gardens that we planted, um, those nine community gardens. So I'm sure you all recognize a few of those. Uh, three of them are schools, three on the bottom, and then the environmental center is also an educational garden. And we were very excited to hear from the environmental center, I think it was within two months of us giving them milkweed to plant in their garden, they had a monarch, a female monarch that came through in October on its way south. So um, you may have heard this already, uh, I know our speakers have that if you plant it, they will come, um, which may very well be the case with milkweed. So um, it's a very exciting thing. So um, next, I'd just like to uh, review our program for tonight. Hopefully you can read that okay. I had to shrink down the words. Um, basically, we're going to have three different speakers. And after each speaker, we'll have a question and answer period. I'll put a mic up here right at the front of the aisle. And anyone who's interested in asking questions of our speakers, you know, you're welcome to come up. Um, if you would prefer not to come up to the mic, uh, we will have our speakers up here near the stage at the very end of the program. And um, you can ask questions at the end as well. And also at the end of the program, uh, I would encourage you, a lot of you have already done this already, but I would encourage you to go out and visit some of the tables in the lobby if you haven't yet. We've got some great partner organizations out there that have worked with us on um, a lot of milkweed planting or educational um, curricula and programs. So um, definitely check them out. Some of them, so um, Sun River Nature Center and Discovery or Forest, as well as the Mako table, have signups available for you to put down your name if you'd like more information about them, or if you'd like to uh, volunteer and get involved with some of the citizen science or the milkweed planting that we're going to be doing, uh, we'd love to have your participation. So let's see, also at the end of the program, uh, we will have some uh, milkweed seed for sale. So um, some of you might have gotten some already, but um, it's at the Sun River Nature Center table and also the Mako table. So anyone who's wanting to start their own way station, we encourage you to stop by and um, purchase a, a, a bag of, uh, or a, an envelope of milkweed seed there. And um, all the proceeds go to Mako. So, and we would encourage any donations, of course, as well. So, but I want to emphasize that um, sometimes folks get confused. We are not a nonprofit organization. We're just a group of citizens that are passionate about this and um, we put our efforts together to make it happen. So, um, Finally, I'd like to ask everyone to silence their cell phones if you haven't already, while I introduce our first speaker. Matt Corning is a geneticist with the USDA Forest Service Pacific Northwest Region, stationed on the Deschutes National Forest in Bend, Oregon. His primary responsibility is to provide guidance to land managers on the use of genetically appropriate plant materials and restoration activities in Eastern Oregon, but also consults broadly with natural resource specialists throughout the Western US. Much of his work is focused on creating seed transfer guidelines for native grasses and shrubs planted on arid lands in cooperation with multiple collaborators. You'll join me in welcoming Matt Horning. Okay, thanks, Kaja. Uh, 
here. Um, I'm kind of having one of those sort of career moments, or one of those moments uh, that makes me stop and say, how did I get here, right? So, can you hear me over here? No. Yeah. Nope. How about this? Yeah. I'm going to not wander. I tend to wander. But, uh, you know, it's nighttime, we're in a church, and I'm talking about monarch butterflies, and I'm just kind of thinking, how did I uh, end up here? <laughs> and, when, and when I knew that we were having a church venue, I thought, there's no way we're going to speak from the pulpit. You know, we're going to be off to the side, <laughs> in the corner. <laughs> okay, <laughs> do this. <laughs> um, and what I, what I do with my time for the, for the agenda is two things. Really, I just want to kind of um, give you the background on the basic biology of monarch butterflies. I realize that um, a lot of folks here have maybe seen some of the presentations, and I know that in general, folks in Bend are really into natural resources, and so it's probably a species that you're familiar with, but um, I want to make sure everybody's on the same page. So I'm going to do a very short intro, so if you have other questions, we can talk about, about the basic life history traits, we can talk about that later. And the other thing I want to do is really just paint a picture of what's going on in Central Oregon, um, and highlight that in the context of what David and Tom are going to talk about uh, alongside other regional efforts. Um, so why monarchs? I've got a couple reasons. One is it's an iconic species, right? We're not here to talk about cabbage white butterflies, right? We're here to talk about, about monarchs. They're, they're um, flashy and uh, something that really generates a lot of interest, right? Um, and so they're iconic and they're important in their own right. But I also like to use them as sort of a hook to get people interested in pollinators, right? I kind of consider monarchs like a, like a gateway drug to pollinators in general, right? You, you think about monarchs, you get interested in pollinators, and you start thinking about honeybees and native bees and bumblebees, the pollinators that really do the heavy lifting with our crop systems. And so it's really a useful tool to get people engaged. This is what um, makes them really iconic, is that they undergo this really unique and incredible migration that I think most folks are familiar with. Um, we have a few populations in the United States. There's a non-migratory population in southern Florida. There's this really large, or larger eastern population that overwinters in central Mexico and then migrates north into the United States and southern Canada to breed during the summer before the last generation returns south. Um, we also have the western population, which overwinters in coastal California, and those are the monarchs that we're seeing here. So they uh, leave the wintering grounds and breed in Oregon and Washington and northern California during the summer before the super generation um, return south. This is just a caricature of their life cycle, which is true for moths and butterflies. Uh, you know, we have a few different stages, an egg stage, a larval stage for, you know, we see the caterpillar here, they form a chrysalis, undergo metamorphosis, and then the adult emerges. Um, the key with these life history systems is that um, you need a host plant to lay your eggs on. And there's a lot of species that are generalists, so they'll use multiple plant species to lay their eggs on. Um, but there's some that are specialists, and the monarch is one of those specialists. So the reason why we talk about monarchs and milkweed in the same breath is because their, their host plant um, in the United States is uh, milkweed, different species of milkweed. So that's the key, and that's why we always talk about milkweeds along with monarchs. Again, this is just a picture of the Western population. And it, um, you know, being somebody who's interested in monarchs, it's sort of frustrating the Eastern population gets the bulk of the attention and it gets a, the bulk of the conservation dollars, and um, that hurts us out here. So we have, a large, we have a monarch population, it needs our help, and sometimes it's hard to attract attention to the work that we do out here. And that's a reality of um, just not being the center of attention in the uh, sort of the national scope. So again, overwintering in California, advancing north over a couple generations to breed as they migrate, and then returning, the super generation returns to, the, to coastal California um, uh, to overwinter. This um, schematic shows really the, the nature of what's gotten people's interest, this, this dramatic decline. So these are the overwintering counts, or the Thanksgiving count for the Western monarch population. Uh, the Xerxes Society of Invertebrate Conservation 
leads this up and they manage the data. And you can see, you know, we've dropped from about 1.2 million down to about 200,000 between 1997 and, you know, roughly 1997 and 2014. So you can see there's variation yearly, but that variation has gone down and down. And uh, it doesn't take much to really knock these populations back um, in terms of weather and, and other factors. Oops. So, along with, what, what are some of the contributing factors to this decline? And this is a laundry list that you could apply to any pollinator species, really, or many pollinator species. Um, they're losing overwintering habitats in Mexico and California. Uh, breeding habitat loss, so in their northern migration, the sources of, uh, the locations of milkweed and breeding um, um, areas have been reduced through uh, agricultural practices and development. Um, diseases and parasites that we won't, we won't really talk about tonight. Uh, it's climate change can kind of exacerbate some of these issues. And then pesticides in terms of direct applications onto um, pollinators, but also herbicides that have been applied to their host plants, right? So when you think about it, right, this is a tough way to make a living. It's no surprise that uh, these, uh, the species is so, is so much trouble. When you factor in specific overwintering grounds, uh, one host plants, um, this, this incredible migration, that's a hard way to maintain large population numbers in, in my mind. I don't want to spend a lot of time on pesticides and herbicides, and that's a whole other path we can go down, and this, this isn't really the, the venue, but this is uh, you know, a big deal. So neonicotinoids are uh, pesticides that have gained a lot of popularity over the last couple decades. And these map, this map is from 1999 versus 2010, showing the increase in application rates over that time. And um, this is for glyphosate, so this is an herbicide that's spread on a lot of crops. I mean, if you, if you look at the crops in the Midwest and what's applied, it's, it's uh, this herbicide. And this is from 1992 to about 2010. And the orange, the orange up here is, uh, is about a quarter pound per square mile. So uh, it's a very effective insecticide. And for um, the orange down here, it's, it's, almost, it's over 88 pounds per square mile. So, you know, that's a legitimate, that's a, that's a pressure if you're a pollinator, <laughs> um, to put it gently. Um, and uh, that's just something to consider. And it's, I think it's one of the larger causes, but uh, uh, I don't really want to talk you know, too much more about it. So given this, Situation, given the conservation concern and interest, uh, I really want to point out that the the Forest Service is on it. That's you know we have developed a conservation and management strategy, and we have this um, this framework in place to help address some of these issues or, or, or to provide a framework moving forward to um, uh, organize what we might do. And I'm not going to walk you through this document. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to do that. <laughs> Uh, you know, we highlight research needs and management needs and um, outreach needs, like, I don't know, something like this, right? This is a good outreach. Uh, and one of the um, takeaways is that we need to survey for monarchs and milkweeds. That was one of the basic uh, um, first steps, just go out there and see what's happening. So given that strategic framework, um, in 2014 and 2015, we looked for milkweed uh, populations here in the larger Central Oregon neighborhood. And I don't know how well you're gonna see it in the back there, but each one of these little green dots is a milkweed population. They can be really small patches, a little bit larger populations, but the, everything that we find is pretty small scale. Uh, and the species that we're looking at in green is um, Asclepia speciosa, <coughs> which is showy milkweed. And that's our native milkweed to <coughs> central and eastern Oregon. We have a couple of blue dots up here in the gorge, and that's Asclepius fascicularis, which is a uh, narrow-leaf milkweed. Uh, it's also a native, um, but we don't really find it in our neighborhood. We find a lot of it in the gorge and to the south of us, and um, in talking with Tom and others, it's sort of a curiosity why we don't see more of it here. It seems like it should be here. But of course, we started with the historical records, the historical herbarium records, and we didn't see much, and indeed, we didn't find a lot in our surveys. Speciosa, on the other hand, is much more common, but it's not ubiquitous. It's not all over the place. So it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's a common plant out here. 
So just two little sidebars uh, before I go on. Um, whenever we talk about uh, milkweed, the first, first question is, is it invasive? The second question is, is it toxic? So I just want to take a couple minutes and just do this little sidebar because I think as you engage with Mako and, and start signing up for planting milkweed or doing other projects, a lot of people ask these questions. Um, and in short, I kind of just mentioned this, but where we find milkweed, it's usually in disturbed sites and we find it in small patches. So maybe some small patches along irrigation canals, uh, roadside patches. Um, we also find it intermixed, uh, competing with um, thick vegetation. So it doesn't take over a lot of sites. Um, and I think, I think air, in the arid west, at least here, and it may be different for uh, David up in eastern Washington, but we uh, don't see it as a noxious weed or something that's really invasive. Now, like any plant, if you water it a lot, if you fertilize it a lot, if you get it soil, sink to it at night, like it may, it may become a, a plant you have to manage in your garden. I have it in my yard, it behaves. I have a lot of other natives that don't behave. So, you know, I'm a, I would not recommend it if I thought it was a problem. It's like, it's my job to not do those things. <laughs> so, it's okay, it's not invasive. And the, people, the species that people think of typically is common milkweed, and that's in the Midwest, and that's known as ditchweed. You see it all over the place. Now I'm from Illinois, I see it everywhere. It's, it's weedy, and I think that's the image people have a lot of times of of milkweed. The other thing is the toxicity, and um, there's, a, there's a couple of issues. One is that um, it does have toxins, and there's, there's like a hundred years of research showing what the toxins can do and the levels of ingestion it takes to kill an animal, and um, animals, your stock will not eat it if there's other food available. If they eat it in hay that's been um, harvested with milkweed, uh, a steer would have to eat something like 12 pounds of dried milkweed to um, either get really sick or die. And that's a lot of milkweed. But you can see here, you know, here's some nice, happy, healthy horses, green pasture, living side by side with speci speciosa. You know, these dairy cows are still standing. Um, <laughs> you know, the, this latex is it's not really palatable. And what they've found is that. Um, if you have a paddock or a pasture and you have no other food source, then this cat, the uh, livestock will eat it. But if you have no other food source in your paddock or your, your pasture, then you've got other issues in addition to <laughs> just having no food. So, but the one concern though is if you have it in a pasture that's gonna be harvested for hay, you wanna make sure that you don't, you don't want it in a, hay, a pasture that you're gonna be harvesting basically. Because you don't wanna be passing on all that material to somebody else or to your own livestock. So it's just something to manage. That's just a picture of a caterpillar. It's not like, I don't have anything to say about it. It's just uh, <laughs> It's obligatory to have a caterpillar picture you know, when you talk about monitors. But I do want to switch over to talking about the actual insect. Um, so along with the milkweed surveys, we started looking for monarchs. And of course, the first thing I always do is go to the existing data. And um, the Xerxes Society of Invertebr Invertebrate Conservation, uh, they're the stewards of the the database, uh, that's what they do. And um, these are their records for Central Oregon for our, uh, um, before our surveys. And so they have, you see these few sites here. I think they go back maybe 10 years or so. So maybe the early 2000s, 2005. And these are only breeding records. So they don't um, just count adult observations. They only count if a another life stage was found, like an egg, or a caterpillar, or a chrysalis. And that's all they had. And I, I worked with Xerxes directly, and, and I um, went back and forth with them to make sure that we're looking at, you know, a comprehensive picture of what they showed. And we went out, driving around, and uh, this is what we, what we found, right? So this is a much different picture, so number one, number two, right? It's better like this, is it like this, right? <laughs> Uh, these are a combination of um, uh, breeding records as well as adult observations. But even though we incorporated adult, adult observations, it's not like they added a bunch of other dots to the map. All of those dots represent multiple reports per location. So 
those aren't, that's not all the data, you're not looking at all the data, you're simply looking at where we found it, whether it was an egg or a chrysalis or an adult observation. Sometimes multiple reports at a single location over, at the, over the summer. Um, this just kind of highlights this. I don't know if that's going to show up in the back, but I just have this coded by um, life stage. You can see there's a lot of breeding in central Oregon, up here on the John Day, up north of Madras. Um, so they're not, it's not like a migration, they're not just buzzing through, they're breeding here, which is an important um, uh, distinction. The other thing I really want to add and emphasize is that um, citizen scientists are crucial to this work. So I've just broken this down by observer type, and these green dots are the Forest Service. Um, the purple dots here are the Fish and Wildlife folks on the Malia Refuge. We have some folks that reported things from the Burns Paiute tribe. And then all these yellow dots are, are you folks, right? So we've got a lot of reports from Bend, the north of Bend, and down here on Summer Lake and elsewhere. And that represents a lot of data, right? Um, and the other thing I want to point out before we move to this slide, too, is that you know, this work is really, um, especially for the Forest Service, it, it was Chris Jensen, uh, Amanda Duvall, and Nicole Amato. And Nicole, do you mind raising your hand back there? <laughs> so these three people <laughs> spent a lot of time behind the windshield finding monarchs, finding uh, larvae, managing the data that you sent us, managing our own data, and giving it to Xerxes, correcting errors. I mean, they did an incredible amount of work, just three individuals over just a couple of seasons, right? I mean, what Nicola and those folks did is just amazing. So that's the federal employee that you give a thumbs up to, right? There's a lot of work and really quality work. Um, the other component of this is that all this data goes straight to Xerxes, and then it goes to the Fish and Wildlife Service. And so they have a lot of um, larger research studies going on uh, in, in, their, in their own program of work. And one of them is to basically do a habitat suitability model for showy milkweed in the western U.S. So they want to know, based on where the milkweed is, where do we think it can grow? And how might that help us direct our conservation efforts? You know, where might we start planting it if we want to start increasing breeding habitat? And, you know, this is us. <laughs> right, when you look across all the data that came in, Eastern Washington well, you know, the Snake River Plain lights up really well, the blue areas show um, um, suitability for milkweed, but it all depends on the data that's submitted. So this is something really a complicated modeling. So I'm not even going to talk about it, because I'm not, you know, I don't understand it that well. But our data feeds directly into that effort. A couple minutes? Two minutes? OK. I got two minutes. <laughs> um, so if I was going to recommend something here, and, and, you know, just to wrap up, uh, you know, put a dot on the map. You know, if you're out hiking, biking, whatever, in, in the woods, uh, consider keeping an eye out for monarchs. If you find milkweed, start looking at some leaves. And so the Xerxes Society uh, at um, forward slash milkweed survey, they have great tools to capture that data. And you have different flavors to choose from. You can do an online submission. You can do an Excel spreadsheet. And you can get in, into that data if you want to. Um, there's that other uh, data reports you can generate. And they also have an app, right? So of course there's an app for looking at <laughs> monarchs. Um, and it's Monarch SOS from uh, Nature Digger. I didn't check if it's free. I'm going to guess it's free, but don't quote me on that. Yeah, free. Thank you. Um, so it's on your phone, like everything else. You're out there. You can get the time, the number. If you find a tagged monarch, which, whoa, you know, uh, <laughs> that information, you can record that in there. There's a cheat sheet, right? So we have the Viceroy butterfly, especially east of us here, and it's a mimic. It's a little bit smaller. And it's distinctive, so once you start looking for these things, you can tell them apart. But if you're not sure, here's the cheat sheet. It shows you what an egg looks like, caterpillar. And your data from your phone, from your family hike, goes to Xerxes, goes to the Fish and Wildlife Service. And I don't know, I don't know how, much you can, how, how better you can contribute than do something like that. So I'm done. I'm going to finish up. Thanks. All right. Okay, it's just...
Oh, yay, it's actually on. So um, I was going to put the mic up here, but I think what I'd rather do just to save time, because we only have a few minutes for questions for Matt, is to go ahead and raise your hand if you have a question for him, and um, he can point someone out, and then we'll just repeat the question, uh, whatever it was. So does anybody have a question for Matt? You can also save me for Tom and David, since they're the, the experts. Go ahead, right here, yeah. Do you have an estimate of the number of butterfly species in the area, and how many of them are, are being studied? You know, I can, so how many butterfly species are here and how many are being studied, and this is going to be a question, David, I think you can answer better. I mean, I know of a handful around here that I pay attention to, and um, to be honest, I'm a geneticist, and I, I approach this from the plant side, and my uh, um, um, entomology skills are, like, rookie grade, so uh, I'm, I'm aware of a few species, but you could probably give us a number. There's probably about 100. 100. Thanks, David. <laughs> you showed the um, statistics saying that 1997 had like 1.2 million. What was the years prior? Was that always a high number? Oh. Or is this cyclical? Do you guys remember what the pre-97 data is? This? That was an extremely high. That's super high. high. Yeah. So do you have a rough estimate for it was pretty much that high. I mean, that was a, a very high year, but the preceding years were in that ball park. So similar population numbers prior <coughs> to 1997. Thanks. That is a great segue. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, with that. <laughs> David, um, I'd like to give a shout out to um, uh, what I call the Mako crew. And um, they may not want me to point them out, but I'm going to anyway. <laughs> this is the group of folks who, um, who banded together to create Mako and do a lot of the programs um, that we do right now. So um, we couldn't have done um, a lot of what we did in the past 10 months without them. So, um, Charmaine Powers. Where are you, Char? <laughs> I should make you stand up. <laughs> and uh, Jennifer Curtis. There she is. Margaret Marshall. The lady in the butterfly hat. Sue Anderson. Karen Gentry. Where are you, Karen? Right. And Matt Horning, of course. So thank you all so much. Uh, it really has been a joy to work with these folks. Um, I have not known a more passionate group of people, and uh, they give a lot of their time to this. So uh, thank you. So David James is an associate professor at Washington State University at Prosser and worked on conservation biology control of insect and mite pests of hops and grapes. He has published 180 peer-reviewed scientific papers, and in 2011 he co-authored and published a widely acclaimed book on the life histories of Pacific Northwest butterflies. Currently, David is working on sustainability of IPM. Thank you. Integrated Pest Management. <laughs> Love those acronyms. And Conservation Biology Control in Viticulture, Insect Conservation, and Community Research and Education Projects. Please welcome David James. Thank you very much. Um, but tonight, of course, I'm going to talk about the monarch butterfly. Uh, and I will be talking about tagging, but first of all, I want to talk a bit about um, some new work uh, about the uh, breeding activity of monarchs in the Pacific Northwest, specifically Washington. 
as Matt said, we know very little about Western monarchs, um, particularly their breeding. A simple, you know, we know the life cycle, obviously, as Matt explained, but the actual ecology of breeding in the, in the Pacific Northwest, we, we know nothing about. And so what I'm going to present to you now is um, the first data we actually had on breeding in central Washington. So that's part of the biology. Oh, I can look up there. So this is a, a monarch breeding site in eastern Washington, um, uh, central Washington actually. And, uh, and the, the paper it's going to produce at the end of the year, we published, uh, is listed there. And if anyone's interested, just email me at some point in the future. So, so this is this is milkweed heaven. I think we can dispense with the slide I missed. It's a unique site. It's uh, it's along a creek and it flows into the Columbia River, um, but it's almost water wall milkweed. Um, it's 2.4 square kilometres of water wall milkweed. So it's very unusual. Um, I don't know of another site like that in Washington. And from Matt's comments, uh, I don't think anyone's seen anything like that in Oregon either. Um, so it, it is a unique site, and it's known to uh, have monarchs there for, for a long time. Um, but so during the year that the monarchs arrive, uh, in the three years I've been studying the population, they always arrive in the first week of June, um, between June the 5th and or second week of June, uh, 5th to 17th. In fact, monarchs generally um, arrive in Washington in the first week of June, uh, in, our, in, in this area, maybe the last week of May, uh, and it's been very predictable over the last three, four years. Um, so they arrive and they find this breeding site um, very easily, apparently, because they always turn up there like clockwork. Um, just a few, um, and they're in this sort of condition because they're they're migrants and they've come from Northern California or maybe Southern Oregon. They've flown a long way and, uh, and their wings are pretty beat up and they're, they're probably quite old as well. Um, but they always turn up about the same time. And they, they lay eggs and reproduce uh, and the first generation of locally produced adults occurs in early to mid July. Uh, the development of a generation from egg to adult is somewhere between four to six weeks depending on temperature. And at that time of year, in June, July, it's, it's four weeks. So early to mid July, they're flying. And then there's, there's a second locally produced generation in late July to August. Um, and at this time, nectar resources are very sparse at this site. And this is one of the problems I'll talk about in a minute. Um, the milkweed is finished blooming. And they depend upon purple loosestrife, which uh, if you're a noxious weed specialist, you'll know that this is one of your enemies. Um, but it, for the monarchs, it is essential at this site. They cannot survive without it. Unfortunately, um, this land is managed by Fish and Wildlife and um, Bureau of Land Management and various other government bodies, and they're quite happy with um, the loose strife there. It's not in huge numbers. It, it just um, it, it's quite, um, it's under control, basically. So it's okay. It's not going to be eradicated, and, and the monarchs are very grateful for that. Um, so, but the unique thing about this population, this site, is that it's a residential site. The butterflies do not leave, they just build up. Now all the small sites that we know of in the Pacific Northwest where um, there's just a few patches of milk, uh, you know, a, a small patch of milkweed of, of maybe 10 to 50 plants, they tend to be used by one generation and then the resulting adults would fly off and find another patch. So, you know, there's a constant turnover. But this site, presumably because it has such a vast resource of milkweed, has a residential population, and the population builds. So, you know, beginning of June, there's, there's maybe 20 monarchs turned up, you know, 10 males and 10 females, I estimate, um, in most years. But then by um, mid-July, August, the population's estimated at uh, um, three, three to 500 individuals in the one site. So you can go to this site, and be assured of seeing monarchs flying around quite commonly, uh, particularly near the uh, loose stripe. Um, so it's unique from that, that point of view. And um, so there, there's the estimated population there. Uh, the scale goes up to about 200. We did mark recapture um, as a technique of estimating the population. We only marked uh, males, not females, because we were using females for other things. Um, as I'll talk about later. Um, and so we estimated population of males um, in those years between 
150 and 200 at the peak, which, you know, it's a 50% sex ratio, so there's between, you know, 300, 400 um, overall population. Um, this is just an estimate, and uh, I think it, it could go higher in some years. Pointing this right, apparently. So, so in 2013 and 2014, the population did really well, got to that great height um, in August, and then towards the end of August, they, they left on their southward migration, um, leaving the site. But in 2015, as you'll all remember, last year was an extremely hot year. It was in central Washington, as it probably was here too. Uh, and the population crashed. Uh, monarchs do not like excessive heat. Um, their optimal temperature for development, caterpillars and uh, eggs and pupae, chrysalises, um, is, is about 86 degrees. Um, anything above that, then there's increasing mortality. Um, and we had a period of time um, between June 26 and July the 10th, when the average maximum temperature every day was 103, with an extreme of 109. So there's a two week period there which coincided with immatures uh, developing um, that period there above the, the line, when a lot of mortality must have, occurred, must have occurred, and that was reflected in the population that we saw that, the, that had a dramatic decline. Um, so very hot summers like we may get in the future are not a good thing for monarchs in, in the West, um, Pacific Northwest or Western uh, US. And uh, one of the reasons is that um, the milkweed suffers greatly, as you can see there, so there's our water wool, water wool milkweed suffering on July the 14th, and uh, just a few days later it, it's, it's just all dead. Uh, but fortunately, um, there's another noxious weed at the site too, which is actually necessary for the monarchs, and particularly in a year like last year, and that's Russian olive, which is a tree um, you may or may not be familiar with. Um, I don't know if it occurs around here, to be honest, but it does in central Washington. And um, it, you know, it's been there for a long time, and um, there's not much movement to try to eradicate it. Now it can't be eradicated. But at this particular site, it is quite common. It seems to have um, uh, dominated the, the, sh the, the bush and tree landscape. And a lot of the milkweed grows underneath these um, Russian olive trees. And it, those, those milkweed actually do survive um, the heat much better and remain a lot fresher and more suitable for egg laying than milkweed out in the open. And uh, here's a picture there in the center. You see a monarch underneath the uh, Russian olive tree looking for milkweed to lay its eggs on. Um, so that's where you'll find milkweed in the heat of, uh, sorry, monarchs in the heat of summer. Uh, females in particular looking for milkweed and laying eggs on milkweed under the shade of the trees. The males, meanwhile, haven't really cottoned on as far as I can tell. They're out in the heat patrolling looking for milkweed, uh, looking for uh, females, sorry. Um, there's a female there laying eggs um, singly, they lay them singly on, on the young milkweed under the Russian olive tree. Um, but the, the critical problem in a hot year like last year um, is there's virtually no nectar. There's no native plants that are flowering at that time. Uh, and last year, the, the loose strife, the purple loose strife, also dried up because it was so dry. And that's a contributing factor to their leaving the site early last year because there was nothing for them to feed on as adults. Um, this was a slide from August 2014, the year before. And you can see in that year, there still was plenty of loose strife around. Um, so it's only an excessively hot year, so you know, we're hoping when we don't have the same thing this year, but the way things are going, it, it could well happen. Um, and there are strategies that we're going to work on to try and resolve that problem or to, to ameliorate it somewhat. One of those strategies perhaps is, is cutting the milkweed halfway through the season to allow it to, to replenish, to regrow, um, which it will do. And uh, we think that we're going to try that out experimentally. And if that happens, then milkweed will flower and will provide um, uh, nectar into August and also fresher foliage as well. Um, so the, the outcome, for the, uh, you know, the, the, the message from that project experiment is that uh, it's quite possible that large, dense areas of milkweed may encourage residents and multi-generational breeding. And so you know, for conservation <coughs> in the future, we should maybe look at that, and we are going to look at that in Washington, um, establish, um, you know, sort of increase the, the milkweed 
um, area in the areas that it already occurs, uh, and maybe establish some new areas entirely, but to increase the numbers of milkweed plants in a, in a favourable area and see if that has a, a resultant impact on the populations of monarch butterflies. Because if you have you know, just a small number of sites that are producing 500 or more individuals during the summer, um, that could be key to conservation of the species. And in our landscape in, in Washington, and for a lot of Oregon too, um, milkweed is limited by moisture availability and it's not going to occur in a lot of places because it's just not suitable. So actually concentrating the milkweed into certain areas where it is happy to survive um, could, be, could be a good strategy for the future in conservation. Um, and combined with that, the, the late summer, mid to late summer nectar resources and also autumn as well could also be crucial to their conservation. I know people, are, aside from growing milkweed, are also growing um, plants to help them on their migration in the autumn. And I think that's going to turn out to be a very critical part of the conservation. They do need the adult butterflies as they're migrating towards California or Mexico, do need food to sustain that trip. Um, we are fortunate in the West that we do have rabbit brush, for example, which they do love. Um, but there is a gap before rabbit brush appears when there isn't much around, as I said, this, this breeding site, um, there's, there's a few weeks where there's nothing. And so, you know, identifying some plants that will flower during that time could be uh, important as well. So they do leave and they start the migration end of August, early September. Um, they leave Crab Creek is the name of the site. Um, and they're migrating. But this, this, this now segues into the second part of my talk, which is looking at the migration, which is where I started um, in this research um, four years ago, just wondering where they do actually go. Because although we talk about them going to California, there, if you look at the literature, there is no actual evidence of that, aside from one or two tags. Or actually, only one tag individual from Washington um, of a wild monarch had been found in California prior to the tagging work that, that we are doing now. Um, so the evidence for them to go to California is not great. Um, but by the end of this talk, you'll see it is, it is a lot greater now than it was. Um, so, oh, jump to slide. Um, so, but the, the problem with tagging is um, there's so few monarchs around to tag, as you obviously realise. Um, and, you know, the, the tagging program in the eastern US has been a great success over decades because there's been so many monarchs for them to tag in earlier years. And even, even today, they still tag hundreds of monarchs um, every year. Uh, individuals tag hundreds of monarchs, and they tag thousands in total. Um, but in the West, our populations are so small that even someone like me who spends his life looking for monarchs with a net in his back pocket, um, you know, can't tag enough monarchs. So, you know, during 2013 and 2014, at the site, I tagged 112 monarchs, and I didn't get a single recovery. So, you know, that just illustrates how many you need to tag. In fact, the, you average everything out with the tagged monarchs, you need to t uh, get a tag 200 to be in the game for having one recovery. Um, so, you know, 113, you've got to be really lucky to get a recovery. So, how, how are we going to turn that around? How am I going to um, get enough monarchs tagged to get data um, to show where they go? So the idea was, back in 2012, I think it was now, um, mass rearing. And um, I'm good at mass rearing, but not, not to the extent that I'd need to be if um, I needed to have enough monarchs to be tagged to provide data. Uh, then I got a phone call from the Walla Walla Penitentiary, who uh, was, didn't want to see me or anything. They just wanted to, <laughs> to, they wanted to know if there's a project I had on butterflies that they could get the inmates to be involved with and to, um, to help them get closer to nature and give them something to think about, um, to, to focus on. Uh, prisoners are bored. They, they have nothing to look forward to when they wake up in the morning. And so the, the prison is doing a lot of programs um, to, to, to change that. So I immediately had the idea get them to rear monarchs. Um, so we had the unlikely pairing. This isn't a stage picture, this is a, this is a genuine convict um, <laughs> in Walla Walla Penitentiary, who is at, was one of, in the first year one of, one of the uh, best rearers of monarch butterflies. Um, I shall not dwell on the fact that he's also um, committed serious crimes, and most of the people there are in there for life. 
Um, but they are excellent rearers of monarch butterflies. And, um, and they get, I don't have to pay them. <laughs> incarcerated citizen science, or non-incarcerated citizen scientists. So, so this is how we started with the project of having the, the inmates at Walla Walla Penitentiary rear thousands of monarchs. Um, in the first year, um, it was 3,000 monarchs they reared. Um, so we, when, you re when you're releasing 3,000 tag monarchs, you're definitely in with a chance of getting tag recoveries. And uh, we had a couple that year. Not many because the tags we used were actually made by the convicts who didn't make a very good job of, ma of making tags in the future. They were a bit too big. And, um, but we did find a couple in California, which I think we doubled the, the data that we'd had before, the single data point before. So it was a success. Uh, and we've done it now for four seasons, I think, uh, 2012 to 2015, and we've got a lot of data. Um, the in this, just some shots of the inmates um, and what they did. Um, they constructed their own rearing materials. I told them what was needed. Um, they used recycled drums like this one here, um, created cages out of them. Um, I impressed upon them the importance of keeping everything scrupulously clean. Um, because that would um, you know, ensure there was no disease, etc. That was the biggest problem, having disease. And they did that. I mean, it's a cliche, but they had time on their hands. And they spent all the time with the butterflies. And they, they, they had a real bond with the caterpillars and uh, really felt something when they accidentally trod on one or accidentally, you know, something, one died. They, they really took it personally. So in that first year, they had 80 85% success rate. So out of every 100 eggs I gave them, they get 85 monarchs, which is incredible. I mean, I can't do that um, because I'm not going to spend the time with them that, that they can. Um, and in the wild, as you may or may, not, may or may not know, every, out of every 100 eggs, only five um, to seven uh, actually become adult butterflies because of the natural enemies and predators and parasites that, that will kill them. Um, so as well as providing enough monarchs to collect data on migration, they're also doing a great service to the, for the conservation of the butterfly. Um, we've released, over the last um, four years, almost 10,000 monarchs. Um, and uh, so they're, they're growing milkweed in the prison and outside. There was some concern at one point if they could grow it in prison because um, they thought they might eat it or smoke it or do something <laughs> that they didn't want them to do with it, um, but that, that, that hasn't happened. So, But with prisons dealing with them, everything has to be uh, fine-tuned and, and not anything, nothing can go in that, that could cause harm to the prisoners or be used in the wrong way. Um, so, and their devotion to caterpillar rearing was remarkable, high su success rate, as I said, um, mainly due to the cleanliness and hygiene. Um, and it was hard convincing them that tagging doesn't harm monarchs. Um, it was really difficult to get them to tag them. They're, they're great at doing it now, but you know, for a while, that you know, these, these guys that um, have inflicted serious harm on people um, were worried about injuring a butterfly. Um, so it was a bit of a, a weird experience for me out there. But after a while, I, you know, it was, it was easy to talk to them, and it was um, you forget that they're there for a reason. Um, <clears throat> they did an excellent job, they're doing an excellent job, they, they rotate different groups of prisoners every year, uh, it's not the same prisoners all the time, they have to be well behaved to be part of the program, uh, and they look forward to it every year, I get the phone calls every year when we started, you know. So, um, I've got a commitment now to the prisoners of Walla Walla. Um, and releases our media and events, um, it, this has got a lot of uh, focus. Um, prisoners rear in monarchs, there's been a lot of publicity about it. Uh, and so, as I said, over the years we've, we've almost 10,000, um, but it's not all prisoners. We have some non-incarcerated citizen scientists that have been involved in this project too, uh, particularly in the last couple of years, um, particularly in southern Oregon. Uh, Linda Kaplan, who's sitting in the audience here, has been a great help and um, we've tagged almost a thousand there last year. Uh, I've got groups in Idaho, uh, in Washington, uh, don't have a group around here, so you know, this is one of, the, one of the reasons I'm happy to talk to you here, to see if there's anyone that's interested in tagging monarchs, um, um, you can talk to me later. So, uh, so from 
Nearly 10,000 monarchs, we've had 26 meaningful recoveries. Uh, when I say meaningful recoveries from greater than 50 miles, we've had a lot more than that uh, under 50 miles, but we use that as a cutoff point to, to, to indicate that they're obviously heading somewhere purposefully. Um, <clears throat> and that's only 0.26%. So again, that illustrates you, you, know, you, can't, you can't just tag 10 <coughs> monarchs and expect to get one. Um, However, sometimes you can be lucky, and a, a slide later on I'll show you how we were lucky once. Um, but 26 out of nearly 10,000 of very serious data points, and I've just got a few here. And in this day and age, we've been, everybody's got an iPhone, except me, I don't have one, but I'm glad everybody else does, um, because they can take pictures um, easily. So these pictures here are just snaps taken by the general public may or may not know anything about monarchs. This guy here is uh, David Hamilton in California. Um, the butterfly was uh, released in the Yakima in my own backyard, actually, in Washington um, on September the 4th. Then it was found in Glen Ellen, Glen Ellen California um, by David Hamilton, who just saw it in a garden, um, a park, actually, and snapped the camera and got a beautiful picture that I can read the serial number on. So this is, this is a tag on the butterfly. This is how you tag them, sorry. The head of the cell here, but the tags are little, little white sticky labels that you put on the underside of the wing in that position there, um, and they stay on for the life of the butterfly. So it's, it's remarkable. Um, so here's another one here. This was uh, this was released in Applegate, Oregon, by Linda Kappen, um, I think, and uh, photographed in San Mateo near the San Francisco airport by Albert Fong in his backyard with his iPhone camera. So. Great. And that, that was, you know, the first record of migration from Southern Oregon to California. Um, the first definite data point um, of, of a monarch doing that, making that trip. Uh, this one here <coughs> is uh, a monarch in an overwintering colony, one of the Californian overwintering colonies at Santa Cruz. Um, and this one was raised and released by the inmates at the Walla Walla Penitentiary on September the 7th, 2015. And it was found on February 5th, 2016, 700 miles away. Um, so it had flown that distance. And in fact, this individual was seen three times during the winter, um, two times prior to February. So as well as also showing that it flew that distance, it also, the tagging, demonstrated that the butterfly, when it, when it got to its overwintering colony, stayed there uh, for the winter. Um, so tagging can give us a lot of information. Um, this is a, a little, neat little story too from the Southern Oregon Monarch Advocates. Um, they've only been tagging since 2014. Um, but this, this slide here shows uh, um, the first caterpillar, uh, um, a new Monarch way station at Medford. This was just last year, I believe. Um, they just set up the way station about this time last year and a caterpillar, uh, they saw, you know, a Monarch came through and laid eggs and a caterpillar was seen there. Um, in August or July, I can't remember when, no, August probably. Um, when the, so that's the, the actual caterpillar there with the photograph taken of it. Um, and, um, and that's the butterfly that resulted and released with uh, children around and, uh, you know, it, we had a, um, a learning experience for everybody. And then it turned up in a Californian overwintering colony of Bellinas, the very same butterfly. So this butterfly that was the first butterfly to turn up at a, at a um, Monarch way station um, actually was tagged and was actually found um, 450 miles away at Bellinas in Northern California. So, you know, your way stations that you, you're creating um, really do help. I mean, because this, this Monarch wouldn't be there, wouldn't have existed without um, that way station, perhaps. So, neat stories. Um, and this graph here, if you can see it, um, is a, just an amalgamation of uh, the, uh, most of the 26 recoveries. Um, and as you can see, all the lines go to California, except one. And, uh, and this is why we, one of the reasons we started the project in the first place, because there was anecdotal observational evidence that some autumn migrating monarchs in the Pacific Northwest aren't actually heading southwest or south. They're going um, more southeast or directly south. Um, and so we wanted to see if that's true. Perhaps they are going to Mexico. And this individual that flew from Walla Walla to uh, Idaho certainly wasn't going to California. Um, there aren't any winds around at that time that would have blown it off course. The monarchs are not blown off course anyway. 
they go to where they want to go. So it's quite possible that some of our uh, Pacific Northwest monarchs do go to Mexico. Uh, we haven't had any recoveries from Mexico yet, but that's not too surprising because there are millions of monarchs there and you don't usually find tag monarchs when they're there. You usually find the, uh, the wings of the tag monarchs when they've died on the forest floor and it's usually the local people that find them uh, and then they go around and collect them and then wait till the American researchers come back the following year and send them, uh, sell them for five dollars each. Um, <laughs> except recently we found that a lot of them, uh, the, the, the Mexican people, have actually been hanging on to their tags for a number of years, not selling them straight away, maybe put it away like a piggy bank or something. So just in this last year we had a lot of tags, and, and, and the previous year, a lot of tags turn up from the early 2000s and even 1999. Um, so, you know, people are hanging on to them. So, a uh, long story cut short is that some of our tags may have actually gone to Mexico, it's just that we haven't received them back yet. Um, and every year that we do the tagging, then, you know, the, the possibility that some are going in that direction um, is, is, is possible, and maybe we'll get recoveries one day. Um, oh, that, so that, that other slide was, uh, was just to show that if, if the, the Utah monarch went continue down, he would have been heading through Arizona and on to Mexico. Um, and of course it's a much longer journey and there's less chance, it's a more remote area, less chance of people actually having an iPhone and catching the you know, picture of the tag butterfly. But, uh, so we need to tag even more. Um, but certainly a lot of our Pacific Northwest monarchs, and probably the ones from the more western areas and central areas, like Bend perhaps, um, would not go to Mexico, they'd probably all go to um, uh, California. I think it's the ones in Idaho and further to the east that, that potentially may go to um, California. And we've yet to have an, an Idaho monarch from California, actually. So that, that sort of uh, suggests something different is happening. So the California overwintering sites, I hope if you haven't been to any of those that you do go at some time, they're spectacular places. This is natural bridges. And even though the numbers, you know, as you saw in the graph earlier, aren't they impressive uh, compared to what they used to be, certainly the spectacle of the butterflies on the trees is still um, awesome, um, as my daughter would say. Um, so it, it's worth going, uh, particularly Pismo Beach, uh, Santa Cruz, natural bridges sometimes, and um, there's butterflies on the trees there. Um, great opportunities for taking pictures. That's just a bunch of monarchs just hanging like leaves on the tree. Um, well there's, there's a tag butterfly in that tree there. It's up there. Too. So I, I go down there um, with my family and I, I have to say that all the work that I'm talking about so far is totally unfunded. Well, everything I do with monarchs is unfunded. Um, in my opening, um, you know, okay, two minutes, I've got two minutes. Um, I'm, I'm a pest management researcher, as you heard, not a monarch uh, researcher. Well, I am a monarch researcher, I was just not paid one, that's all. Um, I'm trying to rectify that, that position um, with the, you know, the more better availability of funding these days. But, but at the moment, it's unfunded. So this, this is a monarch tag in a tree with my little binoculars. I couldn't read the number, so it's extremely frustrating because a number of tags have gone un- um, recorded because we couldn't read the number in the first years that I was doing this. Um, so then I splashed out and, and bought, bought the equipment. Um, this, is, this is just a, a diversion. This, this monarch has taken his tag off and put it on the leaf up there. It's not one of my tags, it's one of the University of California tags and they were using very old tags so if, if you ever do tagging, don't make sure you use the tags within a year or two. If you save them from a number of years, they lose their stickiness and on a fly, we'll take it off for you. Um, so with the right equipment, 100 feet up the tree and a spotting scope, bird of spotting scope, I was introduced to spotting scopes by a birder who was walking past where I was struggling with my binoculars and, and said, you've got to use this. And, and uh, you know, $6,000 later, I, I got <laughs> Well, you've got to be dedicated to doing this and passionate about doing it. And, uh, and so much work had been put into it, I had to do it. Um, so I don't get Christmas presents anymore. Um, so there's lots of overwintering sites. There's 200. I'm going to have to go through this since I've run out of my time. Um, oh, this is my favourite recovery. This is December the 31st, New Year's Eve last year. I was down there. I take my family with me. We go, you know, the, my daughters know that this is um, 
this is what we do on our holidays. So um, as a, as a, as a um, compromise, I let them go shopping in the shopping mall because that bunch of trees in the background there is a known overwintering site that's used some years um, and, and not others. But it was used last year and there was a thousand monarchs there just sitting in one bunch on the tree. And one of our tags was there from Walla Walla. So I was able to tell the prisoners, and they get really thrilled when they hear that their butterflies turned up in a shop in Portland, California. <laughs> and or on the coast in an exotic location. Um, this, an, this is the record so far from the distance traveled, 800 miles from the penitentiary in Walla Walla to uh, almost Santa Barbara. And it was just in a colony of 50 individuals in this tree found by a citizen scientist, and there's lots of citizen scientists down there counting the butterflies, Thanksgiving overwintering counts, um, just in that little colony there. So, edges of golf course isn't popular for the colonies. Um, this is a big one at, uh, near San Leandro. That tree's covered in monarchs butterflies. The over overwintering sites are vulnerable, um, but um, there's a lot now with awareness of the monarch. Um, they're being preserved a lot better, and I, I don't, you know, they should be okay. Um, oh, this one recapture. Um, this is, so everything I've spoken about is the autumn migration. We know nothing about the spring migration in terms of tagging, etc. Um, and so to try and rectify that, um, last year um, in the Trinity National Forest, we did some tagging because you could actually see the monarchs migrating at that time. One recovery. There's my daughter there holding the tag monarch, picture taken by Linda in the audience there. Um, and you can see it's a migrant because its body's fat. Huge. So they're, they're, when they're migrating, they, they, they're full of fat. Um, we tagged 19 monarchs that day, so I wasn't expecting a recovery, but we got one from um, Twin Falls, Idaho, 439 miles from Trinity National Forest, east northeast. So I was expecting it to go straight north, but it, it headed east. So there's a single data point from tagging 19 butterflies. So if you ever do join the, my tagging program, you tag 19 butterflies. You're still, in, you are in the game. You know, if you're lucky, if you win the lotto all the time, lottery, um, you might have a chance. Um, so we know about that growing milkweed. Um, would you like to tag monarchs? If you seriously are interested in tagging monarchs, my email address is up there. Um, if you if you don't get that down and can't remember it, you can go to the Facebook page. Uh, just uh, type in monarch butterflies in Pacific Northwest. Um, you'll find. Uh, my email address there somewhere, I think, or, or just uh, contact me through the Facebook page. Um, we have almost 3,000 people following that page now, so you know, there's a lot of interest in monarchs. It started off with like 100 people. Um, so I've finished my time up. Thank you very much for listening to me. definitely won't be messing with any of those convic con convicts when it comes to their monarchs, that's for sure. Um, any questions for David? We have a time for a few of them. Over here. Over here. What is the lifespan of a monarch? You said the one in California was there for several months. Right. How long does it live? Okay, well, the, the, uh, the overwintering generation can live for up to eight months. So from late August to May, June, about now. Um, but the, the summer individuals, the summer populations, like at my breeding site, they only live for four to six weeks. So they're very different. So you know, the, the, the reproductive ones are burning up their energy by, by reproducing. Um, and the overwintering ones are, are non-reproductive, so they don't, they don't reproduce, they don't have sex, so they, they live for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Right here in the aisle. What do the overwintering sites have in common in terms of habitat and quality? What do they have in common? Yeah, in terms yeah. of trees. Yeah, that's an interesting, yeah, interesting question. Um, they, they're often ravines or gullies, but not always. Like some of the pictures I showed were a little gully with trees. There's not a specific tree they're looking for. It's mostly eucalypts, but that's because there's a lot of eucalypts in California. They will go on pines, Monterey pines, other pines, even uh, other trees, um, other deciduous trees, not, not deciduous obviously, uh, but trees that have got leaves on. They, tend, they have trees with leaves. But sometimes it's the golf courses, and maybe it's because they're on the California coast, and if you look from the sky, 
uh, or on a map or from Google, Google Earth, um, they're, they're, they're usually in the only big patch of trees around. You know, on hilltops too. They like hilltops as well. So there are certain uh, features in common, um, but there's a number of different different features. Okay, we got time for one more over here. We use hummingbird feeders to attract and nourish hummingbirds. Is there a comparable device for monarchs? No. Can no, you repeat the question, David? Um, a comparable device to a hummingbird feeder for monarchs? No, there, there isn't. I mean, there's, there's nothing better than, than nectar plants for them. Um, they're not going to be... I mean, I guess, you, you know, you, you might get the occasional monarch being attracted to a, monarch, uh, to a hummingbird feeder, actually. I mean, they're, they're attracted to colour, you know, um, but also the scent of nectar, probably more importantly than colour. Um, so there are, you know, everybody knows about Budlia being attractive to monarchs and the milkweed itself, the flowers of milkweed, I think they love that more than any other nectar source. Um, but there's, there's a variety of nectar sources, um, but no, there's no, no synthetic. All right. Thank you, David. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to use um, a little bit of time here just to remind everyone. Um, obviously, you've been hearing a lot of citizen science stuff, so um, to remind you about the tables and the signups outside in the lobby uh, with the Mako table, Sun River Nature Center, and also Discover Your Forest. So don't want you to forget about those. And I'd also like to thank the tabling organizations that did join us uh, tonight. Um, they really are great organizations, and so we would encourage you to get involved with them anyhow, uh, regardless of whether they do monarch or milkweed things. Um, with that, I will introduce Tom. Tom Landis is a forester who retired after 30 years of working as a nursery specialist for the U.S. Forest Service and has spent the last three years on creating pollinator habitat in Southern Oregon. Using his nursery experience, Tom has been learning the secrets of growing the three native milkweeds as well as, increasing, as, well as an increasing number of nectar plants. Due to a continuing interest in monarch restoration, Tom has given over 60 monarchs and milkweed workshops, including one at the Society of Ecological Restoration meeting in Manchester, England last August. Please welcome Tom Landis. Thanks, Katya. Thanks for everybody coming out. It's really great to see such a good group. Well, I've only got about 15 minutes, so I'm going to hit things pretty fast and heavy, but I'll be around afterwards if you'd like to get a little more information. As Katya you said, I'm a forester, so what am I doing with monarchs? That's a really good question, and something I wouldn't have predicted a few years ago. I've been doing this for three years. Pretty much everything I've learned has been on the job. My disclaimer here is I'm not an entomologist. I'm going to leave that to David. I think I had one entomology class in forestry school, and that was a long time ago. But what I'm representing is the Southern, or uh, Southern Oregon Monarch Advocates, SOMA, and so most of the work is not mine in, in particular, it's, it's what they have done, what we've done together. Well, how I got started, just decided one time uh, that uh, I, th I thought I'd like to get involved because when I grew up in uh, Southern Kansas, monarchs were everywhere when I was a young kid. When we moved to Southern Oregon, I'd see one or two a year, and when I dug into it and looked into the reasons for that, I found out that they were in trouble. So I thought, well, I'll just start growing uh, milkweed and see what I can do. And so that's what my backyard, I had some old redwood, uh, built a couple of monarch way stations with the two native species of uh, milkweed. That's in 2013. Only had one caterpillar show up the first year. Second year we had about 25 we raised, and then uh, last year we had around 100. So in, in three years we've had quite a track record. I also started playing around with controlled rearing, because as David said, uh, people would call me and say, oh, I've got three or four caterpillars, and they'd call me back two or three days later, and they're gone. What happened to them? And so we, we decided to build it in explosions, trying to keep the pests off. And then I've been really involved in doing uh, workshops. And this uh, paper, uh, newspaper article from the Monarch, or from the Medford Mail Tribune, is one of the things that got me started. So I'll talk a little bit about each one of those. Oh, here we go. There we go. 
Okay, as Katya said, I've been doing a lot of these. I've got so far 64 of Monarch and Milkweed workshops, including one two days ago down at Sun River. Uh, last Saturday, I was in Carson City, uh, Nevada, uh, doing one there. And as she said, the, the one furthest away was in Manchester, England. I went and did one at the Society for Ecological Restoration, uh, talking about working with communities to restore monarch butterfly habitat using native plants. So, and the key word there, I think, is community, because as Katya said, one of the great things about this is the people you meet, the relationships, and the, just the great enthusiasm of the people you've been working with. Any of you here with the one I gave in January in, what, 2015 at Onda? Yeah, there were several of you. There were about 140 people there that night, and uh, it, was a, it was by far the best attended uh, workshop that I'd had until this date here. So. Something about Ben, you guys are definitely enthusiastic. <laughs> so I, I was real glad to come back. Well, as everyone said, David, Matt, there really hasn't been a lot of research done. Uh, one computer model that was done by a couple of professors down at San Luis Obispo, Cal Poly, they did this map here, and the green areas are the areas they predicted in the northwest or on the west that were good butterfly habitat. When I showed this to Katya, she was like, well, don't show that. Central Oregon, there's, you know, it's not a good habitat. But I think that just shows, it's just lack of data. We really don't know, and as David has said too, and, and Matt as well, we need, to generate, we need to generate some better data because I think there's a lot of potential here. Obviously, you guys are on the migration corridor here, but I also think it, it might not be everywhere here, but there are certain pockets here that are like the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge that are prime breeding habitat. This is just to reinforce some, something that Matt already said. So historic data, Central Oregon, there were five reports of, of, of monarchs. Matt and his group, they found about 20. So already we've changed, just in one year, we've you know, quadrupled or more the, uh, the amount of information we have. And hopefully with people like you, we're going to keep improving on that. Well, when do we see monarchs in Southern Oregon? So I'm from Medford, and what Conti asked me to do is kind of hit the highlights of what SOMA, our Southern Oregon monarch advocates, are doing there, and the way that maybe you guys could apply it here in Central Oregon. Well, we start seeing them about in April, and we see them all the way into October, maybe even November, so that's the breeding cycle down there. Uh, we've seen them as early as the end of April. This year, last night, I got a call from one of our Cooperators down there, we found two eggs on some narrow leaf milkweed. So that's the first uh, confirmed report we've had that breeding has started in Southern Oregon. And this is kind of a, a different uh, version of the map that, that Matt made. I just wanted to show the four generations. Uh, California is the only one that has all four, uh, especially this first generation off of overwintering. When they get up to us, we see about second, third, and fourth, up where David is, maybe third and fourth only. Uh, Joe here works for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He couldn't make it to this meeting, so he asked me to put in a plug for the work they're doing. Matt mentioned it briefly, but I was going to highlight it too because it's a good chance. Uh, Matt gave the, the uh, information on who to contact, but it's a cooperative, cooperative effort between the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Xerxes Society, and they, he sent me a couple of their updated maps, and so the dots on there are actual locations of, this is a speciosa, uh, showy milkweed, and you can see down by us, up, up around Ben, you can see that the, the red color is the suitability of the habitat, high is red, so you can see up near where David is, really high suitability, and then of course the Snake River Plain, but there's also some areas out here around the John Day River and such that are good habitat for, uh, for showy milkweed. This is the one that was really interesting to me is because a uh, narrow leaf milkweed is the most common one we have and it's actually the preferred species down around the, the Road Valley, but it's just not that common. As he mentioned, there's a little bit along the Columbia River, but we're finding more and more of it. I just got a report uh, from a workshop I did in Klamath Falls down at Lava Beds National Monument. There's a really good population of narrow leaf milkweed here out the Hart Mountain Refuge. There's some, and we even found one up here on the Spokane River of all places. 
but why why they're scattered like that and why we don't see more here is something that I'm I'm really interested in looking into more because I think it's a great species. Okay, so Soma helped start ten monarch way stations in southern Oregon. These are the signs that we put up. This is the one I just delivered to Sisters Middle School. They're starting a monarch way station there at the Sisters Middle School. So we, we end up working with all types of organizations, schools, uh, other groups. And of course, the three mad, uh, basically a monarch way station is habitat, food, shelter, and water. So we have the native, native milkweed. I usually use both species in mind, both showy and narrow leaf milkweed, a variety of nectar plants, shelter, and then water. And we registered the Monarch Way Station. The actual idea came out of the University of Kansas. And so monarchwatch.org, we register all of our way stations. And I hope you guys do too, if you get involved. I know Katja's been doing that. So when I started giving workshops, it was December 2013 for Oregon. There were 15 registered way stations. Two years later, we were up to 54. Pretty good. And I'm taking credit for all of that. <laughs> And I'm sure we've got even more than that. That was as of last uh, December. But uh, yeah, if you do want to get a waste station, uh, be sure and register because that's a good way to good way to document the uh, your, the uh, location. So this is a, a plant palette for my waste station. Basically, what what plants we put there to attract the monarchs and other pollinators? As I said, I put both narrow leaf and showy milkweed. They bloom at a little different time. There's just a little bit of difference to them uh, in, in the in the blooming. Uh, the time, so we use both of those, and then based on a natural resource conservation uh, group, they recommended early spring flowering, summer mid flowering, and late flowering. So we try and get at least three species from each of these groups, like Oregon grapes, a good native plant. You guys have that around here too. Coyote mints, a good uh, summer flowering nectar plant that's great for pollinators. And as David said, rubber rabbit brush is a an amazing pollen plant, uh, nectar plant later in the year. And we've actually got a, a book we're working on showing that if, if any of you'd like to see later, I've got a copy of it down there showing the uh, species that we're recommending. So they're on. There it is. Pollinator plants from Southern Oregon. Susie and I uh, developed this last winter. We're still looking for money to publish it, so I've got one copy that I made there. But if, if you're interested in the PDF file, I'll be glad to give it to you. This is what each page looks like. Here we have ocean spray, which is a good nectar plant. And it's really cool because it's also a host plant for four different other uh, butterflies, four native uh, species of butterflies. So we're, we're recommending it for that reason as well. And it shows when it blooms, May through July there, plus just some other information there. So we've got a page for each species. So we've got it broken into early, middle, and late blooming species. I think Katya and I are going to work together and maybe get something like that for you folks as well. The other thing we've been doing for three years is now we've been, when I first started, I could not find any local milkweed seeds. I actually ordered some from Monarch Watch, and when I got the pack, the, the, uh, the uh, seeds, the packet, it said Western Seed Source. Now, what the heck does that mean? Western Nevada? <laughs> so I didn't use it. I actually started mine from... Uh, from rhizomes. So we're now collecting seeds. We've been collecting for three years. We've got these really cool packets. And we're distributing them free to people at uh, workshops, uh, other organizations. And I can already see that Mako's already doing that. I hear you're selling seeds out there in the, in the levee. And the reason we want to have locally adapted seeds is this is from a Monarch Watch. They actually have seed zones. So here am I in, in Southern Oregon. Our seeds would not be good up here in, in, in central, uh, central or eastern Oregon, obviously, just because the, uh, the climate is so much different. So we're really trying to get people to collect and develop uh, uh, seed production areas in their own local region. And Matt and his group, uh, Chris Jensen, who couldn't make it out tonight, but at Clarno, they have the showy and narrow leaf milkweed. I guess this is wrong, it's not 23 sources, it's about 18, but they did the exact right thing. They collected uh, rhizomes from a lot of different geographic regions, grew it together in a common garden, so you get cross-pollination, you get better seed quality than you would if you just had one, one source. So that's, that's what we recommend. 
I've also been working with a lot of nurseries. My job with the Forest Service was a nursery specialist. And so I got the University of Idaho to actually do a research project, and this is it. They grew it up in, actually in Washington State, and those are all milkweed. They had a different container types, fertilizer, water, that sort of thing. And right about the time it was done, the grad student, uh, uh, she had to quit the project, and so the, the major professor, Anthony Davis, is still trying to write that up, but hopefully I'll get that information out to you soon. One thing that I found, just working myself, was that the young milkweed plants don't transplant well. Unlike, you know, the, the plants you buy, a tomato plant or something from a, from a garden, they don't have a good plug, and if you pull them out of the container, the, the media just falls off the roots. So we're trying to use, uh, we call it stabilized media, in this case it's paper, to hold that, hold that root plug together so that they transplant easily. And one of my obsessions, too, is propagation from rhizomes. I just took one out and dug this out of my garden right before I came over here. This is a six-week showing milkweed from a rhizome right there. Uh, it was harvested from the Forest Service nursery uh, in, in Medford, stored all over the winter, and I just put it out in my raised beds, and six weeks later, we've got a plant that's probably four to five to six inches tall. You get a lot bigger plants, a lot faster from rhizomes than you do from seeds. So I'm going to keep plugging that as, as a way to get bigger plants faster. Tagging, David's already covered that really well. I just wanted to show our Soma group, and, and Linda here in the front rows shows her tagging one. Interestingly enough, this is a, a cordifolia. It's, it's the uh, heart heart leaf milkweed, uh, an unusual species that we have there. So she's done one of uh, She's done a lot of our, our tagging, and they all end up down on the California coast. But 10 from, from uh, Southern Oregon, so that's pretty good. Well, this is what got me into controlled rearing. Uh, this is real recent data, 2015, and it shows eight days. The green are eggs. These are first star caterpillars, second star caterpillars. So in eight days, as David said, 95% of those are lost, especially the eggs. So at the end of four days, you're down to about 15%. So you've got to protect them. Uh, we found that ants, spiders, one of the guys that is, is ra uh, raising monarchs for me, he says he went out and he collected, he found an eight, he looked, an ant, and he looked down and was carrying an egg. So ants and spiders. Uh, another friend sent me this from uh, the Willamette Valley. Uh, wasps. Uh, Al Shapiro is an entomologist at UC Davis. He, he just says that yellow jackets and wasps, they literally go out and hunt for caterpillars. So uh, I think that's where you'll find somebody who says, oh, I've got five, six caterpillars. Three days later, they have none. I actually been using wasp traps around my, uh, my way station. So we've been rearing them inside. Uh, Preventing OE disease, this is one of the, the it, it's a real serious disease that's carried on the adult. And collecting eggs is the best, so we've been trying to find the eggs just as soon as they're laid, we take them in, protect them, or real small caterpillars like this first or second instar there. And proper sanitation, so we've been really trying to keep, keep the uh, milkweed clean. We're working with schools now. Um, Last fall, we had two fourth grade classes. Uh, I got the milkweed for them. A friend of mine got the caterpillars for them. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service bought the enclosures. And they raised about four to five monarchs each and released them. And it was just real popular. And we're going to do that again with more schools, probably about the 1st of September, when we can be sure that we can get caterpillars for them. But kids love it. This is a picture for that Marcy and I took in the backyard. So our SOMA members released 2,116 monarchs last year. One fellow raised well over 500 himself. And if you haven't done this control during, I'd certainly recommend it. Like, each monarch is a little miracle. I mean, you'd think you'd get tired of it, but you really don't. It's just fascinating. Other school projects, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has been an amazing partner. Uh, they have what they call a schoolyard habitat program. So we're working with schools. In fact, uh, one of the ladies I work with is right now planting, uh, planting uh, plants down at a school in Medford, emphasizing environmental education. Uh, in Phoenix, that's just south between Medford and, and Ashland, 
Uh, this is a group, of, this is actually the same school where they raised those last fall. They're going to actually put in a, a Bonnard garden right here. It was just a bunch of uh, saw that really wasn't that, uh, wasn't used that much anyway, so they're building it up and we're going to be planting plants. Here's Jen Jones, she's uh, uh, doing a soil test with the kids. So we're actually putting that in probably right this week as we speak. Uh, South Medford High School, uh, Jason Bauer here is a horticulture teacher there, and so he called me up and so we, they had a big parking strip that really wasn't being used. We got again, got funding from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So we just about three weeks ago planted a whole strip along there, and I'm going to go check it out when I get home. But we're actually going to have that under irrigation. But kids got really excited about it. Uh, this Akimi King, who was fishing wildlife out of Klamath Falls, told me about this, and I thought it was real interesting. So this was last summer. They were plant planting, showing milkweed in these bins. Here's the plants. But 1.5 weeks after planting, let's say 10, 11 days, they found caterpillars. So that's telling me that there are, there are gravid females out there looking for milkweed. Uh, and they said the same thing happened at another location. Within about a week, they had eggs on them. So I, I really think that just shows the need for milkweed in those locations. Uh, we have a lot of community outreach. Uh, this is Robert Coffin. Uh, he developed, he and his family, Simone and, and Tiffany, he, this is big boy. We have this caterpillar that kids can put their, put their heads through. Uh, they have a caterpillar toss. We've got the little nets up there, and, you, and they have these beanbag caterpillars that you can throw in the area. So we've got a lot of things going like this. This was a tree planting at Arbor Day. How green can you get? We've got a monarch planting a tree on Arbor Day. And it's, as I said, it's just the amazing cooperator. There's Linda, Susie Savoy. So these are just a list of all the people that really made it happen. Uh, it certainly wasn't me, but again, I think. It's more than just the monarchs, it's the relationships you make and it's, it's the fun you have together. So I, I really would, I would emphasize that if you want to get involved. And just to end it up there, there's my contact information in a couple of monarch cartoons here. If you can't read it, this top one says, so where do you see yourself in the next five weeks? <laughs> and down here, the cop's checking the license. He's got a caterpillar on that. He goes, oh, that's an old photo. <laughs> So thank you. All right, so um, I think what I'll do is, since we're running a little um, over time, um, I think I'd like to just encourage anybody who has questions for these guys to come on up and talk to us. And I had to change my shirt because I felt a little stood up by David, so what do you think of this one, David? Do you have this one? All right. It's also to remind me that uh, for any of you who do not have milkweed, my, my t-shirt says, got milkweed. Um, we have milkweed out in the lobby, so please stop by uh, Sun River Nature Center's booth or our makeup booth, and we'll be happy to sell you some milkweed seed and get you started. Uh, because once you get started, um, it's easy to uh, collect your own seed and, uh, and keep it going. So um, let's give one more round of applause for our speakers. Please. Thank you, David and Tom and Matt. Um, and thank you all for coming in. And um, we hope you guys will get involved with us. Have a wonderful evening.